What's up, everybody? This is Kelly Cook for YouTube Live. Everything Phoenix, guys. It is Thursday, so that means it's another YouTube Live no matter where I am in or on the planet. And I am, guys, currently in uh, Houston, Texas for a, um, a real estate conference because, you know, you never can know enough. You never can stop learning. At least you shouldn't. And um, so I want to make sure I'm down here. And this video, this conference actually is specific to real estate video. And so um, I uh, uh, want to uh, do my very best to bring you guys the best content and the best best uh, possible YouTube channel there is. So without further ado, let's jump right in, guys. We're going to talk about some really cool things that are going on here in our beloved city of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and one of those things is the housing shortage that is a real thing. It's a real thing. And then we're going to talk about water, right? Water is always going to be a somewhat hot topic uh, for the foreseeable future. And then of course we have some tax issues and some other development issues that are, that are very interesting when it comes to, um, you know, the housing market in the Phoenix area. And one of these things that we're going to talk about that I didn't even put on here is, is the 40 year mortgage making a comeback? Oh boy. So now we're going to put a bandaid on it, right? Affordabilities through the roof. So now we're going to try to, you know, concoct these, you know, new ideas, not terribly new, but newer, um, you know, because it's not a very common that someone does a 40 year mortgage. So we're going to jump into that and do the pros and the cons, the pluses, the minuses guys. So if you don't mind, just let us know where you're watching from. I'd really appreciate it. Um, we get people from all over the place, uh, reaching out to us and watching the video, even on the replay. But if you wouldn't mind, let us know where you're watching from, ask questions. Let's make this a two way conversation as much as possible. Cause we're going to dive right in. So let's do just that. I'm going to share my screen as I always do guys. And we're going to talk about um, this first, okay? We're gonna talk about the commentary on the housing market. Actually, I wanna show you this blue graph first, all right? This is the supply. This is the active listing account right now for the Phoenix entire greater area, greater metro area and all the suburbs. And you can see right now, you can see the hump, right? You don't have to be a, uh, a very astute individual to realize that we don't have a whole lot of inventory. Now, we have 12,000 properties for sale, which is a heck of a lot more than what we did have when the market was bananas, right? Look at this. In March of 2022, we had 4,000. So let's be honest, we have a lot more than what we did. That's a good thing. But demand is also a lot less than what it was because everybody was like a gold rush, right? Everybody was jumping in and trying to buy a property because when one person does it, then two more people do it, and then four more people do it, and this, this you know tsunami effect occurs. And then, of course, eventually the music stops and some people are left without a chair. So, um, as you can see, since then, the market has increased dramatically with supply because the market slowed down, right? The Fed raised rates. They wanted to um, stop the economy being so hot and on fire. So, they did that, and, and they're getting their intended result to an extent, right? So, then you can see all the amount of inventory that we peaked here in October, coincidentally, that was when interest rates were the highest as well. So there's that direct correlation, right? And then we came down here, and now we're back down to um, 12,000, you know, uh, 185 properties for sale in the Phoenix area. So how can you sit there and say, Kelly, there definitely is supply? What are you talking about? You're exactly right, there is. But supply right now is very low compared to the demand also curtailing. So this is interesting. We're going to jump into this and talk about it. So this is the net result. I'm going to show you right now the net result of this. Um, supply issue, if you will. Here we go. Here's a commentary from the Cronfer report. Today is the 13th um, and April 10th. They came out with this. Guys, look at that V. Now, if that's not a, almost a perfect V for a housing market statistic, I'm not sure what it is. This is phenomenal. This is phenomenal um, in terms of just being a, a visual representation of what the housing market in Phoenix, in Phoenix, has done. This is not to say it's what's going on in Houston or Indianapolis or Boston or anywhere else. But in Phoenix, this is what's happening, guys, in a six-month period. Look what happens. So if you read the commentary, you can see right here, the latest average, okay, the latest average is over 279, meaning the, in terms of price per square foot, meaning the highest pricing during the last six months was recorded today on the 10th, since September, right, in the last six months. I would like to refer to our observation on September 25th, where we claim that we were not in a crash and that our advice was to keep calm and carry on. We have plenty of people tell us. They disagreed and it was a great time to panic. Oh, we're panicking, right? 
wait for the crash, and then jump in and buy. The average price per square foot is now back to where it was in late September. So we believe our advice was sound and our observation accurate, guys. And most likely, it's going to be on the Cronford Report, which is a good reason to tune into this YouTube channel. Why? Because they deal with facts, not fiction. There's no drama. It's just data. And if you interpret just the data without a hidden agenda, because guys, the Cronford Report, they get paid regardless, right? People like me are paying them regardless. So whether they say the market's going up or down or bad or good, they're still being paid. So there's not a hidden agenda for maybe a, a, a fee or um, you know something to get more subscribers or whatever, right? There's none of that with the Cronford Report. So we're bringing you that data. And the data typically is correct because not only are they very smart individuals, but they know how to tell the future to an extent based on previous data and where the data lies today. So this is interesting. If you keep reading this, which maybe some of you have already peaked, Although the dip between November and January was a bit scary, because it was, the recovery in price has been equally strong since then. Volume is well below normal, meaning transaction count is low, with both sellers and buyers lacking enthusiasm, but prices are buoyant and in even better shape than we expected. That's interesting, right? That's interesting. No, no, I'm going to read this. This is due to the seasonal effect on the luxury home market. Unless we get an unexpected source of new supply, which no one knows where that's going to come from anytime soon. The fourth quarter should show a rebound from the dip that we might see in the third quarter based upon seasonality, meaning that the annual appreciation will have turned positive. The annual appreciation would have turned positive by November of 2023. But I thought the housing market's going to crash. All the clickbait. Guys in Phoenix, not looking like that whatsoever. Volume will take time to recover while skepticism remains dominant. The next stages of hope, followed by relief, should not be far away since the market number we are seeing is improving. All right now, look at this. Here's the month of supply. This is similar to this graph I just showed you right here, right? Uh, this is supply. You can see where it's going. There's 2023. There's a nosedive. And it's not crashing clearly, but it's low. It's low. And look at compared to the previous years of 2021. And of course, 22 was very even lower right here, like we just talked about, 4,000 or so. And then it came flying up because the market slowed down. People were not used to and being freaked out by higher interest rates. So right now, this is a 2.0. We're below a two months of supply for the Phoenix area. A two months of supply for the Phoenix area. Guys, what does that mean to you? Comment below. Let us know. Let us know what that means to you. Um, is this positive news? Is this good news? If you are looking to buy, would you jump in? Would you still wait for some reason? I'd love to know why. And so would the Cronford Report because look what they say next. This is interesting. We have below a two months of supply, okay, uh, which is less than 3.8 months we had in uh, last November. If you have clients, here we go, who think prices are going to fall further, ask them to explain where the new supply is going to come from that would cause that to happen. Prices are unlikely to fall unless supply rises to more than three months. Foreclosures remain very scarce. And single-family home builders have dropped their production plans sharply, driven by an abundance of caution. With prices for new homes holding up, they will probably regret that caution over the next several months. So again, guys, it, it, just, it just falls right in line with that old saying that's been around forever. It says, you should not wait to buy real estate. You just buy real estate somewhere in the cycle and wait. Perhaps owners of short-term rentals will, will tire of that business. You know, the BRBOs, Airbnbs that didn't rent out as well as they probably thought it would based upon 2021 20, and 22. Now the occupancy rates are down, are well down from a year ago. They're disappointed with the receipts from the Super Bowl. A lot of people were, guys, remember you saw that, that article. We only had 52% occupancy rate during the week of the Super Bowl, which is down from over 88% for the last two years for the last two host cities. That's interesting. We have an excess of short-term rental supply to an extent, meaning that owners will have to compete with each other on price for short-term tenants. We are headed into a low season for the, you know, uh, for holiday rentals for you know Phoenix being the summertime where it gets hot and we have less people visiting. Um, so we may see those get may see some of those get sold off, right? If I own a short-term rental property with disappointing occupancy rates, which she said she doesn't, this is Tina Tambor of the Cronford Report talking. I would wait for higher prices before considering selling. So conversion to a long-term rental would be my first step. Now, let's jump into here. I love doing this, guys. Guys, I got a comment. 
Okay, I got a comment from somebody on one of the videos I did, and I'm going to you know, talk to you directly here in this one because this is interesting. I got a comment, and the person said made a comment to the uh, extent of saying something like this: um, "I don't know what you're talking about when it comes to saying there's no supply and you know um, all that stuff because." I went out to Santan Heights, which is a subdivision out in the East Valley, the far Southeast Valley, on the outskirts of the valley, Santan Valley area, Queen Creek area. And there's a lot of supply. There's homes that the builders want to sell. There's homes for sale that people want to sell that are resale homes. So what are you talking about? You're just trying to make a quick buck. And my response to that is not at all. If you listen to what I say, I have to make general statements. But also, too, I will always break down specific cities. Right. Uh, and this is what the Crawford Report does, because not every city is created equal when it comes to supply and demand and certainly price points. So let's share my schedule, my uh, my screen here and jump right back in and show you this. This is interesting, right? I'm going to go back to here. OK, here's the different cities, the suburbs. And there's the CMI, the Crawford Market Index. Remember, 90 to 110 is balanced. Below 90 is a buyer's market. Above 110 is a seller's market market. Okay, so let's look at Queen Creek, which is the closest thing to Santan Valley, right next door to each other. Santan Valley is a little further out uh, in terms of the, uh, from the main metroplex. We look at this and look at Queen Creek is at 86.1. It is a buyer's market. So there is going to be inventory in certain areas, a lot more inventory. Okay, let me, let me, let me back up. First of all, guys, there's inventory everywhere. Let's be clear about that. In no way am I saying there's no homes for sale because there clearly are. We had just under two months of inventory. Some places have more inventory than others. And right here in Queen Creek, we are in a buyer's market. We're below 90. Even though it's increasing, we're below 90. But look at Maricopa, 78. Look at Buckeye, 67. I'll go one step further. Let's go really out. Look at Casa Grande here. Same concept, same graph in a different form, in the form of a gauge. Look at this. The market index in Casa Grande is 73. Still not as bad as Buckeye, right? Buckeye was 67. So there are deals to be had if you're looking to buy. If you think that's a good deal, could they drop further? I mean, they, they could. I mean, anything could. But if you look at this graph right here again, everything has been on the rise. Why? Because there's not that much supply. There is not that much demand either. But supply is lower. Look at Buckeye. You have supply in the red at 145. The red is not good. Low supply. Look at demand. It's balanced. It's not super high. It's not high at all, actually. It's balanced. But the supply is lower and therefore keeping the prices, you know, um, you know, somewhat, you know, without falling off the roof. At the same time, because supply is, you know, so much higher, it is still a buyer's market. So if you want to buy to invest, that'd be the place I would speculate right now if I'm going to invest. Uh, but you have to look at rental rates. There's a lot more that goes with that, right? What are the rental rates? Have they gone down in that specific area too? And if you want, call me, 480-660-5974, and we can talk about rental rates and getting you specific data on specific areas, specific subdivisions, and even zip codes if you are looking to do something like that. Or maybe looking to buy just for yourself. Guys, if you're looking to buy for yourself, um, you don't want to treat it as much as an investment, right? You want to be able to um, have peace and comfort to know that you, the house you live in for your family and yourself is going to just be that. And you have to have some place to, to live. So why not obviously buy a place that you can have principal buy down over time? Um, and hopefully you will choose to sell when the market is on an upswing. You will choose to sell. And if you have to sell when it's on a downswing, hopefully you don't have to actually truly sell. Maybe you have to sell from the standpoint of being relocated for a job, but could you hold on to it as a rental maybe until the market gets on upswing and then sell when it's higher? That, that, those are all things to consider. All right. So guys. Thanks for hanging with me. That's a good bit of the market update right now. We're going to jump into some of the development issues we talked about because there are some good ones. All right. So I'm going to go over here and we're going to jump into um, some uh, projects. Before I get to the water issue, I'm going to talk about some development projects really quick. I think they're interesting. Something you guys may want to know about, right? Um, but East Valley Project featuring a two-story Starbucks. I don't know if there's another two-story Starbucks. I have not been in one. There probably is one somewhere in the country. But there's going to be a two-story Starbucks in Phoenix coming up here at this area in the East Valley. And eight other more deals to know. So 
The Chandler Air Park Technology Center has completed construction. This is interesting. That's just phase one, by the way. But Mercy Center is a $125 million mixed-use development in, uh, in Gilbert. And uh, they're the regional headquarters for Bell Bank, which is a bank out of, um, I believe, North Dakota. Uh, you have a five-store residence in and by merit, you know, you have more, uh, more multi-tenant retail space. You have a 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven. Huh, they're still building those. Check that out. A Chipotle and that Starbucks is coming up in one of these here, right here. Two-story Starbucks. There's a little rendering of it. Look at that sucker. It's going to be on both levels, clearly, two-story. And that's kind of interesting, right? A live hydration spa, dental, uh, pediatric dentistry, Willow midwife services. Hmm, interesting, right? Um, so there's a bunch of development going on. Here's a few other uh, development projects that you may want to know about. And, and guys, these development partners are coming from everywhere, from Chicago, from New York, from Manitoba in Canada. I mean, they're, they're, they're dumping millions into the Phoenix area because they believe they see where the population increase is going. And so here come the, the really high paying jobs, right? This is a good thing overall for the future of Phoenix and the Phoenix area. And they're building all kinds of stuff. So yeah, Mesa building trades hands, a big area down in, uh, in Mesa here, 200,000 square foot mixed use facility off country club drive. Um, and again, you have financing secured for a Glendale industrial park. Okay. $53 million deal there. Um, uh, logistics center, which is that park, um, just all kinds of stuff going on. I'm not gonna go through every one of these in detail guys, cause I'll probably bore you to death, but I'm just showing you there's a lot of continued new uh, projects being announced going on in Phoenix and a lot of its development. Um, in Tolson, a new distribution center right off the I-10, um, you know, is, is transacted. And of course, more apartments, guys. Um, this one here is a luxury apartment complex. You can see the rendering right here in Goodyear. And it's 95% leased already. 95% leased. Because of population growth pretty much everywhere in the Phoenix area. It's pretty pretty wild, right? Um, so anyways, you get the idea here. Uh, this is Arizona State University Residence Hall. That's, uh, you know... Uh, being renamed to Gordon Commons, and then all kinds of New York City stuff here. Here's, uh, oh, by the way, this is interesting. Scottsdale based the joint. They have over 800 chiropractic franchises locations, um, or should say locations with different franchises. Um, 800, the joint chiropractic, chiropractic, and they're going to Puerto Rico. Pretty cool. Based right here in Scottsdale. Okay, so that gives you an idea. Then you, I'm going to go here. I'm going to talk about this Dallas company that uh, is a developer that um, has partnered with CBRE the commercial brokerage firm to develop Channel Crow to develop um, a, a, a land here for uh, future development from someone else. So there's a, there's a rail line by Union Pacific Railroad um, and uh, they're basically going to develop all the land around it and all of it, but a big portion of land, 192 acre site right here um, to get it ready for someone who wants to come in and buy it, turnkey, ready to go. Um, so, it's pretty crazy what they're doing there. And that's, again, out in the East Valley. A lot of development, guys. A lot of development. All right. So now we're moving on. Um, almost here from development. But one more thing. Look at that headline. Valley home builders ready to buy land, but few big deals getting done. So why is that? Well, th what, here's the bottom line. They're talking about land brokers. They're talking about land um, bankers. Excuse me. Land bankers are people who are buying companies, buying land. And get ready to get the infrastructure right to be able to um, uh, have it ready to be sold to a large home builder to come in and build a big community. And there's a lot of that going on, and a lot of it's being prepped to being sold to these, you know, like a DR Horton or a Pulte, that sort of thing. So there's there's just literally uh, thousands of acres, I mean, selling for millions and millions of dollars. And um, and guys, the big thing is these land banking deals. The big thing is they're saying it's not like 2008, right? where people are walking away from their commitments, a lot of earnest deposits, good faith money, um, and they are continuing to proceed with uh, filing permits and plots to get the infrastructure done to build um, homes. So, and we need it, guys. There's a shortage in Phoenix when it comes to supply. So we need it, all right? Uh, moving on here, um, we're cruising. We're gonna get to the water situation. I know you all are itching for that, but I gotta give you a little teaser on some other stuff first. All right, so Phoenix Mayor, Mayor excuse me, Kate Gallego, if I pronounce, your uh, Mrs. Mayor, hopefully I pronounced your last name correctly. Um, but she had a, a state of the city address, uh, another one here recently. And it's just good, I think, for anyone watching this show to know a little, about, a little bit about what she said. And what she focused on, which is a no surprise, is the biotech, the manufacturing of the semiconductors 
and things of that nature. TSMC headlined everything and they pretty much still have. Um, and there's some, there's some stuff about that. A lot of jobs, as you know, over 600 people from actually Arizona went over to Taiwan to be trained for, um, for jobs with TSMC. And then of course, Taiwan is sending a bunch of people from Taiwan um, to actually work at that facility. And, we, and they'll be living right here in Phoenix. We did a, a section on that show about the new Taiwanese culture that's getting ready to you know, sprout, if you will, in North Phoenix over the next probably five years or so. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, if you like Taiwanese food, you're going to have some of that now in North Phoenix. It's coming. Um, so it just talks about uh, bioscience. And this is kind of interesting, right? Bioscience, uh, the central corridor, the north central corridor of Uptown is going to be just the that, that really the biotech uh, bioscience hub. You got Creighton University with a big campus there, $100 million medical school. Yeah, Park Central, you have the Ivy Brain Tumor Center. You have University, um, uh, excuse me, Alliance International University which is doing the new nursing and health sciences school. Um, so it's going to be advanced, a lot of technology, bioscience. It's going to be pretty cool. And Phoenix is kind of leading the charge with some of that, obviously, right here in the uptown area. And of course, she's calling in her state of the city to pass Proposition 400, which is a half of a penny uh, tax um, to help uh, for infrastructure and transportation. So I, comment below. What do you think about that? Would you want to pay another half cent um, for, uh, for a tax, a sales tax? Um, I don't know. It adds up, right? It adds up. And that's what she's hoping to adds up because they need that money for infrastructure. Do you think the, the resident should, should shoulder the burden? Cause we all have to set off the shoulder if we're, if it's sales tax, which it is right on every single item that we buy. So interesting. And of course she talked about water too, which we're going to hit right now. So it's a great segue into the water issue. Colorado river shortages and the ongoing drought have been a major concern for Arizona and other states that rely on the river. All right. Which, by the way, there's a facility that they're really trying to, to uh, turn uh, a lot of gallons of water usage or reusage right here. This new facility would provide new, uh, new drinking water supply by reusing wastewater, also known as direct potable reuse. Interesting, right? Interesting. Abby, what's going on? Thanks for commenting. I appreciate it. New York has a beautiful two-story Starbucks. See, I knew it. I knew somebody had been to a two-story Starbucks, and it has to exist, exist because Starbucks is everywhere. Um, but you know what? We're going to be right behind New York City, right? Right behind them. So I'm, 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 uh, that's, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I don't know. Why not, right? Something different. All right. So um, we're going to go over here, and we're going to talk about the Colorado River. Here we go. Title. As states continue to bicker, feds say Colorado River cuts are coming. Now, to give you a little backdrop on this situation, check this out. There are this many laws about the Colorado River, from state to federal, um, to try to dictate who gets what uh, when it comes to the water. It's crazy, guys. There's so many politics and legislation and laws and, and all the stuff, contracts behind the scenes when it comes to water rights. It's not even funny. Make your head spin. But look at this. I'm not going to go through them because I'll really bore you to death. But look, the Colorado River Compact of 1922, that's just one. Then you got all these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There are 11 um, laws or pieces of legislature right there alone that dictate how the Colorado River water is broken up and divvied up to different, especially these different main seven states in the Southwest that that feed off of it. Did you know that 44% of all um, of all water is actually, uh, that the water that Arizona uses, excuse me, comes from the Colorado River. So it's not like it's 90%, which is good, but I think a lot of people in Arizona believe that it's primarily from the Colorado River, and it's not. But 44% still a decent chunk. Can't ignore that, right? Um, Christ <laughs> oh, here we go. Christina, what's up? AJ, I know I love my... <laughs> I know I love me some Starbucks. Yeah, I do too. I do too. Um, I, but you know what? Christine, I'm going to challenge you. Buy local. Check out some local coffee shops. There's some really good ones around Phoenix. And if you, you know, tune into the, more of these videos on our YouTube channel, you'll see a lot of reviews we have with the KCI Index rating on a scale of 1 to 10, a lot of the local shops. So check that out if you get a chance. Um, you will not be disappointed, I don't think. All right, so here we go. Back to the water situation. Here we go. 
Cuts to water use along the Colorado River could be spread evenly across Arizona and several other southwestern states to follow. Uh, here we go. There are, two, there are two alternatives in a draft plan released by the Bureau of Reclamation. Did you even know we had a Bureau of Reclamation? We do. We have bureaus for pretty much everything, right? Um, but they're going to consider ways to keep hydro power generation going at the nation's largest reservoirs being threatened by historic drought. Okay. So here's the deal. Here are the states affected. Arizona, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, New Mexico, Nevada, and California have been unable to come up with a basin-wide consensus on how to share water cutbacks. Go figure, right? The states can't agree. Weird. Um, that's a shocking to me. I never would have thought that, right? So now the federal government's saying we're about to step in and do something about it, whether you like it or not. So I don't know if that'll be good or bad, but here you go. Here's what they're talking about doing, okay? There's several options for this. And, oh, but let me pause. Here's the good news. Heavy snowfall in the Rockies this past winter has provided a buffer, a little short-term relief, which is good. But what they're saying is that um, everyone knows that's not a long-term solution unless we have you know, heavy snow every year, which we're probably not going to do because we've been on a 23-year drought. So, uh, but thank you, Lord, for the extra snow in the Rocky Mountains this past year. That is going to help a little bit, right? But here are the options. The federal officials suggest three options. One would mandate reductions in water use in Arizona, California, and Nevada based on the current structure for water rights. Here you go. Which would protect California as, the, as one of the most senior users. Well, that doesn't seem right. Why would California, you know, get the, you know, the first dibs, so to speak, right, on it? Another option would levy cuts to water users in those states evenly across the board as an alternative more favored by Arizona and Nevada, of course, because now it's even, where officials have advocated for a more equitable sharing of the need uh, for uh, use reduction. Guys, I love the word equitable because you know what? Life isn't fair. And so fair, fair, what's fair, I don't know, but equitable would be, this would be more equitable if, if all the states could share more equitably the water. That seems like probably a good option for me. The third option is for the federal government to take no action and risk allowing another series of dry years to push the river's reservoirs closer to dead pool levels, which water would not be able to pass through their dams. Now, guys, um, that obviously would not be uh, good. I don't think that's a good option. You can't just ignore it. And of course, if they go too low, then you, you don't get the hydropower uh, that's generated that's needed to for other things. So um, that's probably not going to happen. You're probably looking at more of uh, one of the first two options. Uh, federal officials make clear they hope not to have uh, to use the plan at all, whether they, it's because the region experiences a string of wet winters or states come up with commitments to reduce their rel reliance on the river without federal intervention. Um, but anyways, they're looking over the next 45 days to develop a true seven-state consensus. We'll see. Um, I have a feeling this California, California's top Colorado River negotiator. Guys, there's a position in the state government where somebody's just the California um, Colorado River state negotiator. I mean, how do you get that job? That's interesting, right? We do see that litigation could be possible. Weird, right? We're committed to avoiding the litigation outcome as best as we can by coming up with a collaborative solution. So we're all in the same, you know, kumbaya moment here where we want to have a, a, a solution. Um, hopefully we can all come together and, and, you know, divide that water up equally, maybe per capita or something, right? Um, probably makes the most sense, but we'll see because in government, sometimes a lot of things doesn't make a lot of sense. All right, we're going to move on here to, um, I, I see your comment here. Hey, Jay Christina. Yes, I'll have to check that out. Okay. I love it. Check it out. Please check it out. There's some good, uh, good local coffee shops. There truly is. I had no idea until we started doing these reviews of coffee shops locally around Phoenix. There's some amazing ones. Okay, why businesses transitioning should brace for more tax increases in the coming years. Oh, that's not good. Guys, there are a lot of small businesses, right? A lot. Um, small businesses are the engine of, um, of America, America's economy. Um, it's not the corporations, the big corporations. Um, small businesses make that up. So now it's time uh, taxes will be going up. And what they're talking about specifically, spoiler alert here in this article, are employment, excuse me unemployment tax rates. They're going to go up. Why? Well, because for the last several years, because of COVID, um, those coffers have been completely wiped out and then some um, because of the amount of people who lost their jobs due to uh, the pandemic. So that means it's time for small business owners to pay the piper, uh, which is, you know, not good <laughs> for small business owners. But you look in here, um, state unemployment 
uh, insurance taxes on average increased from 1.72% in 2020 to 1.89 to 2.3 in 2022 with more increases slated for 2023. So it's been going up and up and up. And uh, here we go. So um, in the Great Recession, uh, which happened back in obviously 08, 9, 10, 11, 12, you had an employment rate reached the height of about 3.48% in 2013. So that's at least, I'm sure, where it's going, if not probably higher. So you have that to uh, to uh, you know be concerned of if you're coming here to obviously start a small business. Um, at the end of the day, it depends on, obviously a lot on, on you know the wages you're paying and how many um, people are working. Um, you know, uh, in terms of how uh, big that dollar amount gets. But um, the good news, the good news, because we'd like to focus on the positive stuff too as well at Everything Phoenix here, is that if you did not know, Arizona passed a flat state income tax for 2023, beginning January 1st of 2023. So no matter what it is you're, you're making, state income tax flat now, 2.5%, which makes it the lowest tax rate of any state in the country that has state income tax. That's awesome. So you can you can definitely clap for that one. Good job, Arizona, when it comes to that. That's going to encourage a lot of people to come here and move here, you know, whether they uh, have a business or not or whatever it may be, because everyone has to pay income tax if you live in a state that has it. Um, so why not pay the lowest possible to hopefully keep more money in your pocket? So there you go. Now, here's what I was talking about at the beginning of the show. Feds expand 40-year mortgage eligibility. Experts say it could lead to more. Could you imagine if we had a 50-year mortgage? Oh, my goodness. And this is the, this is the solution now that we're coming up with. I mean, I don't, I don't know about that. I'm not, I'm not too sure about this one. But did you know that the federal government doesn't allow um, HUD and FHA loans to um, be originated at a 40-year um, uh, term? It, it, it's capped at 30 years. Thank goodness. But now... Did you know that if you, and I'll say in this article here, that if you are in default, so now by in default, you kind of get maybe a reward. I don't know. but If you're in default, you now have the ability to push out your mortgage to a 40-year term to reduce payments and remain in the home. But guys, that's just kicking a can down the road, okay? It's not a new concept. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are GSEs, which are different than, than um, you know, what's the, the uh, HUD Housing, Urban Development, and the FHA, which is part of the HUD, uh, HUD program uh, for, for government loans and borrowing. Um, our other government loan programs already offered some 40-year modification options, but the federal government hopes the change will increase awareness of the availability, which will then af- make affordability better, okay? Because it's smaller payment, but the problem is you're just kicking a can down the road 40 years. Um, now, if you live plan on living in the house for 40 years, uh, then that's okay. But as you know, most people don't do that. Most people are moving around and we're talking six to seven years on average is the lifespan for most people living in a house across the country. Um, but this is interesting. Um, some borrows may, may be better off if you're behind. Declaring bankruptcy and starting fresh instead of taking on a 40-year mortgage uh, that could leave them struggling and locked into debt for a longer term. That's the downside, clearly, right? So now you're going, oh my gosh, why is this article coming out? Why is this article coming out? Are there a lot of foreclosures? Uh, is this is this like rampant now? I'm glad you were, you're probably thinking that, and I have the answer for you. Here you go. Okay, foreclosures pending from the Cromford report. Right there's a source. No, that's the answer. <laughs> there's 2010. The company foreclosures we had in 2010, the Great Recession. Right, um, we are in March somewhere in here. There was 49,000 foreclosures pending uh, in the Greater Phoenix area in 2010. In 2023, you can see clearly by this graph, there are 1,040 less than where it was in 2020, obviously with the pandemic. So guys, we are, um, there, there's no uh, imminent threat whatsoever of any foreclosure problem in the Phoenix area. So this is, I don't know the timing of this uh, article, but clearly across the country, um, you know, this is a Phoenix um, article for the Business Journal. Uh, there are some things going on because, you know, with, with some defaults and people getting behind. So uh, they're allowing people to restructure their mortgage, remodify their mortgage um, on a 40-year term if they want to, uh, but they can't originate it when they first buy the house on a 40-year. That makes sense. So we'll see where that goes, but I don't know. Um, There's a foreclosure graph again. Um, Now we're going to move on to a few more things. and We'll be be wrapping this up, guys. We're having an action-packed time here 
with Everything Phoenix, guys. So I'm glad you're joining us. Thank you again for doing that. If you don't mind, just go ahead and ring that notification bell or smash that sub subscribe button. I'd really, really appreciate it. All right. Uh, my view, this, this commentator, this uh, author, um, understanding the impact of interest rates on Phoenix Metro home buyer activity. Guys, we're not going to spend much time on this article because, duh, right? We know that obviously rates go high. We have less affordability, less money to buy, and therefore, um, you know, the, the market the market stalls out a little more, right? And they go down, the market heats up. So that's basically what this is saying. Um, right now, February 2nd was when the interest rate hit 5.99%, which is the lowest it's been in about six months or so, right? Uh, resulting in 2,000 new deals, right, in that week alone. But then the rates went back up, and it started to get a lot less than 2,000 deals in one week alone. So um, this, that's, what this is that's what this article is talking about, right? Um, the incentives. I'm going to touch on this really quick because don't forget about this, guys. If you're looking to buy a house, you have the ability to negotiate with the seller, and most sellers still are offering um, credits to allow you to have a rate buy-down for the first one year, two years, or even up to three years of your mortgage when you first buy your house, paid for by the seller. It's called a three, two, one buy down for three years, a two, one buy down for two years, or a one, uh, one year buy down. Okay. So that being said, um, that's what he's talking about. The strategy of a two rate one buy down gives you some temporary relief if you especially are of the idea that rates will go down a little bit, not like crazy, but just down a little bit and settle back down, maybe hopefully around five and a half at some point here um, over the next 12 months, two years, you can refinance, assuming that the market is at least steady, if not uh, increase a little bit in appreciation, hopefully. Uh, and then you can refinance and then get out of that and refinance into a, a loan that's at you know five and a half if they get to that point at some point in the next year or two. That's the idea. So um, just something you can take advantage of. Speaking of rates, I know you know I had this ready to go, guys, right? So here we go. Rates from my uh, most trusted website, Mortgage News Daily. Check this out, guys. Back down to 6.42, below 6.5. This is good. They've been yo-yoing the last uh, week or so. Um, but, guys, 6.42 is not bad. Um, if we can get down to, to, to 6 or in low 6s, that would be awesome. They dipped down there a little bit here recently. You can see right here, 6.12, 6.13, 6.12. Uh, and then they jump back up and so on and so forth, right? But um, that's good. Here's an article. The inflation data came out yesterday, right? I'm going to give you guys a visual. This is good for you to know. CPI, it is at 5.6 um, in its most recent um, you know, uh, reading here. But look, just a quick visual. Look at where, obviously, it skyrocketed over the you know, last year. And then it's been doing this ever since. Um, you know, July, October, of last, and then October, and then so on and so forth of last year. So this is good, guys. This is good. Okay. And then I had this highlighted right here, I believe. Yep. I still have it highlighted. Stock market futures rose sharply while treasury yields fell following the report. This is the CPI yesterday that came out. Markets were still pricing in a 65% chance. It's like the casino here, guys. It's just like the casino of a final 0.25, 25 basis points, percentage point interest rate increase at the Fed's May next month meeting, though that was slightly lower than Tuesday, according to the CME group. Guys, this is interesting, right? Um, why is this interesting? Why? Why, why, why? I'm glad you asked. It was interesting because, the um, first of all, the markets always price in what they think the Fed's going to do next month, and they clearly think the probability is higher than not that they're going to raise interest rates another quarter point to keep the train of this inflation going down, 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 down. You want to keep that trend, right? That's a good thing for our economy longer term. Okay, I get that. But what's really cool is even though they may increase the federal funds rate, you know what the, the smart money is actually betting on right now? They're betting on that mortgage rates because the treasury yield will actually continue to go down. That's the, what they really think. And here's the biggest reason why. Because inflation is really measured year over year, right? So April 22 is measured against April 23 and so on and so forth. Well, April of last year was the first month that it really kind of took off the inflation uh, in a bad way, right? Up of 2022. Then it got worse from there and got higher and higher. Well, that being said, the, the, the smart people, the experts are expecting May's report, assuming that inflation is going to continue to keep going down a little bit into May, to be lower than what it was May of last year when it continued to go up, resulting in um, that uh, the treasury 
going down and therefore mortgage rates going down, even if the Fed increases 25 basis points on the federal funds rate, which is not mortgage rates. Make sense? So keep that in mind, guys. We're anticipating uh, May 10th is when it's going to come out next month. We're anticipating rates to, um, to, to drop down, mortgage rates to drop down even further from, you know, six and a half ish where they are today. I mean, could that, could that possibly reach six? Maybe, maybe, or at least hopefully the low sixes, which would be a good opportunity for a lot of people to jump in and, and potentially buy, okay, and get that loan secured, even maybe with a two, one buy down on top of it, right? All right, so uh, let's go back over to, I'm going to share my screen. Let's go back a couple more articles and we're out of here, guys. I know your time is precious, so thank you very much for joining us. But I got to leave you guys with a couple you know, fun things at the end. We're not there quite yet, but this is interesting. There's a big legacy sports complex out in East Mesa that, I mean, when I say big, I mean big, guys. One of the nation's largest for youth sports, adult sports, pickleball leagues, uh, basketball leagues, football, flag football, tackle football, you name it, soccer, it's out there. And it's huge. Um, but the North Dakota-based bank, Bell Bank, that is, is relinquishing its rights, naming rights, because they no longer want to be associated with the park. Why? Because they're in debt. They're in debt pretty bad right now. They missed the payment right now to their creditor and uh, their bonds that they raised, they're short on in terms of the money. And uh, there's some people that, you know, obviously need to be paid for the services they did building that park. So what's going to happen? I don't know. I'm assuming there's going to be some sort of government, city government, city Mesa bailout. I don't know. That's speculation. But the bank wants out. They don't want to be associated with that anymore because of the fact that it's not uh, doing well from a financial standpoint. Go figure. So they're getting out. This little tidbit news for you. And then we have two more for you really quick. If you are moving to Arizona, right? We, we talked about potentially, uh, not potentially, the unemployment tax rate going up a little bit for any small business across the country. But if you're moving to Arizona and you want to start a small business, this could be a good option for you. Here you go, guys. Virginia Company wants to capitalize on Arizona's increase in new pool construction. Okay, so what is this all about? This is a company called Pool Scouts. They're um, kind of national. Um, but they are offering a lot of franchises now for sale in Phoenix to maintain all the pools that have been built um, over the past X amount of years. So um, what they're doing is they currently have three franchises in the Phoenix, Phoenix uh, market. But he said there are 14 territories in the entire valley, the Phoenix area, that he'd like to sell to new franchisees. The territories are broken up with 8,000 and 12,000 homes with pools in each territory. And then, of course, it's up to you to do the marketing. Well, the company, you're buying the franchise. So they do all the heavy lifting. And you just figure out how to operate it when it comes to, you know, maintaining someone's uh, pool. So interesting, right? Big business there. But here's the cost. If you're thinking about maybe starting up your own small business and you want, to, want it to be pool maintenance, you're looking at seventy to $88,000 to start up that franchise for Pool Scouts. So listen, I know a lot of people come to Arizona and they're looking for something to do or something to start from a, for a business standpoint. They just want to come to Arizona, to Phoenix, and enjoy the nice weather and everything else is going on here. And so there's an option for you. Pool Scouts is looking to hire people looking to, to buy into their franchise system. Last but not least, this is interesting. The Diamondbacks extend alcohol sales to the bottom of the eighth inning. You're like, what, what is this all about? Guys, I don't know if you knew, but I, I'm pretty sure that alcohol sales for most major league teams stopped after the seventh inning stretch, or maybe the bottom of the seventh inning. I'm not sure. But like, you know, the seventh inning stretch, take me out to the ball game. You know, you, everyone stands up and sings that song, which is awesome, by the way. Um, they cut it off, right? Uh, so now, because of the pitch clock, which is one of the new rules Major League Baseball instituted this year, uh, which, by the way, I think is awesome. The games go faster, and there's more action in between all the pitches, right? Because the pitchers only have, I think it's 15 seconds to pitch every single time. Um, and there's a clock, and they don't, and they get penalized. Um, so now, because the games are shorter, uh, you can't be messing with their money when it comes to concession sales and especially beer sales. So they're just going ahead and just going to bump that out from the seventh inning to the eighth inning so they can sell more and only make the same amount of money, even though the games are a little bit shorter. So there you have it. Interesting, right? How businesses will always confirm, uh, conform and adapt to figure out how to, you know, still, you know, make the money uh, amongst new rule changes that, that you don't even think of when it comes to, you know, some, some niche businesses. I think it's fascinating personally. All right, guys. So um, I appreciate you guys hanging in there with me. Uh, oh, we have a few more few more uh, comments here. Sorry. Um, running at altitude. Thank you so much for watching. You're always on. I really appreciate it. Average new vehicle transportation transaction price, excuse me, is now between now below MSRP after nearly two years. Yes, that means inflation is going down or starting to go down, right? This is a good thing. 
Um, so thank you for sharing that. That is really cool. I heard that, but I didn't have a, uh, an article to back that up. So thank you for sharing that with us. So, uh, and all other viewers, that's really good. Um, another comment. Thanks for the market update. Absolutely. Anytime, every Thursday, I guess I'll probably miss a few Thursdays throughout the course of the year, but my goal is to never uh, miss one if I don't have to. Right. So I'm in the hotel on a crazy wall painting behind me. So if you guys are okay with this background, you can find me in this thing. I'm kind of lost, right? It's kind of crazy colors. Um, Lori, it's always hard to find a good pool company. Yes, it is. So Lori, Hey, you know what? If you know anybody looking to, um, buy a franchise for pool cleaning, pool scouts, buying for 70 to $80,000 and you're in, I'm not sure what the franchise fee outside of that in terms of the monthly renewal or recurring is, um, and all that they provide, but I'm sure it's like a business in a box. And so you pretty much have to show up and just operate it. Right. Um, so there you go. Uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, again, you don't mind subscribe, uh, hit the, re the re notification bell. And we are trying to do this every single Thursday for you, as well as putting out other videos throughout the week for you also on a consistent basis. Appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Um, from Houston, Texas, I'm signing off, and I'll see you next week uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. Thanks, guys.